you're down to three games left, you control your own fate. I think people around the league probably wondering how in the world you're here. What would be your answer to that? We're just singly focused on Buffalo. That's probably why we're here. Uh, we don't care about the three games. We got a big five-star matchup at Heinz Field Sunday night. Man, we're excited about it. And we're excited too. Welcome to the Steelers Roundtable, everybody. The Steelers sitting at eight and five, one three in a row thanks to their victory in Arizona, the final game out west. Joining me today on the panel, former Steelers quarterback Charlie Batch. A lot of questions for him about Devlin Duck Hodges, who is now three and zero oh as a starter. Bob Lariola, kind enough to join us once again here on the Roundtable, and also former outside linebacker Arthur Moats is in the house as well. So, guys, because as Coach said, it is. A big matchup Sunday night at Heinz Field. The Buffalo Bills are coming to town. Let's take a look at the, the playoff picture. As we sit here today, I know there's still three games left, but it is nice to see the Steelers sitting there at that six seed, the Bills at the five seed. So I know a lot can happen, but uh, when you look at the Steelers' remaining schedule, it might be a little bit better than the Bills and also the Titans who are right there as well. So what are we thinking as we sit here? Labs, I know you like to live in your fears. Well, <laughs> I'm looking at Sunday night's game against Buffalo for the Steelers as the difference between going to Kansas City in the first round or going to whoever wins the AFC South, which would be Houston maybe or Tennessee maybe mm -hmm. or um, I don't think Indianapolis can actually win it now. So to me, that's a significant difference. Uh, the way the Chiefs are playing now, uh, I would much rather take my chances with whoever wins the AFC South. So I think that that Buffalo game uh, is really, really significant just beyond getting in. But now I think you also have to look at and consider, you know, who you might have to play when, when you get in. No, and I agree with you. I think that Buffalo game Sunday night, and this is the reason why it was flexed, because everybody expected this at this point. But I think when you see where Buffalo is at, this is now creating that separation. And, of course, if you want to get hot and stay hot, you need to win, especially your home games, when you get to this point. So, man, I, this is very important for the Steelers. And you know a thing or two about Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I might spend a little bit of time up there. But ultimately, I do agree with you guys. Um, this Bills game is going to be key. It's a pivotal matchup. And when we talk about potential seasons, Meetings. A lot of times at this level, it's certain places you don't want to go. And Kansas City is one of those because of the atmosphere that they have. So if you can get this game versus Buffalo, then you know your next two become very favorable because we're assuming the way Baltimore has been playing right now that they pretty much have that one seat locked up. You don't anticipate them having their guys out there for that last game either. Ways. And you look at Buffalo's schedule. If the Steelers beat them, then you own the head-to-head. -head, and then you only have to finish in a tie with them mm -hmm. to be seated higher than them. So, yeah, it's, and I, you know, you don't like to look past anyone or say you're afraid to go anywhere, but that's, that's our job. <laughs> we can say that. And, I mean, you know, Kansas City is looking like they're really rounded in the form now, and uh, Arrowhead is no day at the beach. All right, we got to talk about the Steelers' defense able to close out the game in Arizona once again. And, uh, guys, I, I don't think we're surprised by anything that they do. T.J. Watt didn't have a sack, but he had a pretty timely interception <laughs> as well. Joe Hayden, two interceptions. What did you like about what they were able to do yesterday? Man, well, for Joe, I'm just loving the fact that this is, what, three interceptions over the past two games, and especially after we talked about him in Cincinnati where he dropped the interception. So just seeing his impact, seeing how he's creating turnovers versus a Cardinals team that hadn't turned the ball ball over a lot all season just seeing that type of impact man is just one of those things that truly carries over this defense can play it doesn't matter where you're playing them at any time of the day they have the the, the, the type of players that make plays always and these guys up front they're getting it done I mean even though TJ didn't have a sack but he was able to press and contain and push uh, and force Kyler Murray in that pocket allowing other guys to go out there and make that play for me there was one big play that er early in the game where Javon Hargrave actually made a tackle where yes. Murray had a, open, a lot of open space in the middle of the field. But those are the plays that we won't see because they're not part of the highlights. But those guys up front continue to get it done, allowing the guys in the back, on the backside in that secondary to jump on plays and allow them to go out there and force those turnovers. Or even Mika Fitzpatrick had one when they were down yeah. in the red zone. Mm -hmm. And I thought Kyler Murray was going in the end zone and Mika stopped him. Absolutely. You know, and that's one of the things, too, about – the Steelers defense and the way they use, utilize their outside linebackers. You know, it wasn't that long ago when uh, a Cardinals quarterback expected an outside linebacker to be rushing and instead he dropped into the end zone and intercepted a pass. Now, there was no 100-yard return uh, by T.J. <laughs> Watt, but it was clear he was right. not expecting him to be there. And that's one of the really effective things about 
the 3-4 and the way the Steelers utilize it, you can't always depend upon guys doing what they always do because, you know, they have the ability to come forward or go back. And just on that play there, Murray drops back. He doesn't even look at the defensive rush. Anticipated. He thought it was four-man rush. It was three. And TJ sitting there out there by himself, mm -hmm. and he never saw him. It was immediately as soon as Murray let the ball go, he just – puts his head down. He's like, I never <laughs> even saw him. And that was a nice play by Watt. All right, let's take a look at some of the defensive rankings where the Steelers are in terms of sack th sacks. They are now first in the league with 48 and also first and second in a number of other categories. So, um, yeah, fair to say, guys, TJ Watt up for uh, defensive player of the year. Yeah, Getting your think, vote? I definitely think 100%. Man, when you look at the sack numbers that he has, you look at the impact plays he has, the forced fumbles, and then obviously even when the game where he doesn't get a sack, he gets a big interception in the red zone, ultimately keeping uh, the, the points off the board for the Cardinals. I mean, I think just all season he's been a consistent producer, consistent guy who's been making a strong case all year, and I think now that you're seeing it more and more and it's being talked about more and more, he definitely should get that award. It's amazing because it's almost like he's sliding under the radar because earlier in the year we were talking Mika Fitzpatrick right. as the defensive yeah. player of the year. But when you have two playmakers on that side of the ball, man, it's an easy discussion for us to have. But either way, both of these guys are in consideration. consideration and I think this is worthy of these guys. You know, it is a vote, you know, by the media. And I think that that play there, that interception would will do more for T.J. Watt's candidacy than if he had had three sacks against the Cardinals because he's showing that he's a multiple dimension guy. He's not just a pass rusher. And so when you uh, uh, put yourself out there as a uh, versatile takeaway or versatile uh, playmaker on defense, I, I think that just adds to your resume even more than just pure numbers in one category. Absolutely. All right, we have a lot more to talk about here on the Steelers Roundtable, including Duck Hodges' third start. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Uh, we just want to impact the game as much as we can as a defense, and I think you're seeing everyone's making the most of their opportunities when the opportunities come their way. So um, we're, we're just hungry, and we're never satisfied. So there'll be a lot of, a lot of good film for us to watch and continue to get better as we go into Sunday. punt snap. Gets, oh. gets it out of there. A big rush. Deontay Johnson has to chase it back. Takes it his own 17-yard line up to the, fifth, the 20, the 25, the 30. He's off to the races. 40, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. There goes Deontay Johnson with a punt return touchdown. I don't see any markers down. Do you? Oh, Billy, I do not. And you know what? I was saying, every time he catches the ball, you hold your breath, and now he finally took it to the house. His longest pre previous punt return took was 14 yards. Yeah. This one, to the house, 85. All right, a big, big day for rookie wide receiver Deontay Johnson in Arizona. Two touchdowns, the punt return for a TD. You saw there 85 yards and also catching one from Duck a little bit later in the game. But, guys, what I really liked is the Steelers started fast. It was the first time they scored on their opening drive. It was only a field goal, but that hasn't happened since they were in San Francisco. So that's something these guys have been talking about, and they were able to really put it together on offense. They did, and I think when you get out and jump out to that early lead, the one thing that I was concerned, there weren't many plays offensively that they ran up until that point so it was good to see them kind of get going and at least you know increase that lead with this a uh, the two minute drive at the end of the half there to go up three but we just see that punt return the thing that I laugh at is that when I froze the film I'm like did we even block anybody <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see Cam Kelly with just enough right to be, be able to spring Johnson when he uh, redirected and came right on uh, on the punt return I thought Robert Spillane and Benny Snell mm -hmm. both deserve a little credit for not blocking in the back. Nice. They did get in the way, put their hands up <laughs> yeah. so that nobody... Right. And then Tyler Matakevich also was in a position where if he lost his mind, he could have cracked back on someone, and that's a penalty, and he didn't do that either. So, you know, sometimes the blocks you don't attempt to make really are the critical ones uh, to make the play go. Yeah, you're absolutely right with that. And Danny Smith, that's one of the techniques that he teaches in terms of just getting in the way of him without having to actually hit him hard because, like you said, in this league, those are penalties, and that would cause a great play if it's to be called back. But the thing that I was impressed with with Deontay is, you remember early in the season, he was having ball security issues in terms of catching the punts, 
catching him outside his framework. Right here in this game, we saw every point that, every point that he caught was right between where it needed to be, in between his numbers, elbows locked in, and just showing the fundamentals. So just seeing his growth from a fundamental standpoint is the thing that I'm really impressed with them. And one week after, his fundamentals weren't so good. Right. On that route that, do you think he quit on that? Looked to me like he yeah, did. Yeah, absolutely. And then he didn't, either forgot or just failed to go and touch the interceptor mm -hmm. down, resulted in a 28-yard uh, return. So, you know, for him to bounce back that quick mm -hmm. and do, like Arthur said, all the fundamental things really showed me a lot in terms of, you know, his attitude and approach, especially for a rookie, I was impressed. And when you see this screen that was set up, and he reverses field to get down into the red zone, I think right around a plus three yard line. I'm like, yeah. wow, this guy is really coming to play. But again, that's that field for punt returner and be able yeah. to see the field and reverse field. And then when you bounce right back and you catch that timing route for the touchdown, man, that was beautiful for him to sit back and do that. And of course, when you're working on those timing routes, if it's not right, man, it looks bad. But for him to uh, not get the touchdown there, but then able to follow up with it and, and really secure that victory for the Steelers there, man, it was beautiful. And I thought Hod Devlin Hodges' throw on that was as close to Ben, mm -hmm. I, I think, as I've seen uh, this year from either Mason Rudolph or Devlin Hodges. I mean, it was perfectly thrown, perfectly placed, perfectly timed. Um, you know, it almost looked like Ben to number 84. I right. forget who used to wear that. <laughs> and I think when you look back, you know, look we'll that. see this play I mean, here. But if you take it back to the beginning, the ball slips out of Pouncey's hand. The ball is a little low on the snap. So for Duck to be able to, to bend down, grab that football and deliver it on time, man, that, that's one of those ones where you know you're clicking on offense. Going back to Deontay's touchdown, and you guys were talking about, Santonio Holmes was at the game. He was part of our Steelers Nation Unite Road Warriors block party. Uh, he was at the game, and he was working with Deontay Johnson during pregame, and Emil and Jard were able to get some footage of this, our video guys, um, and they were running the route that caught the <laughs> touchdown. And Tone was helping him with it. Deontay, I had a chance to get him right after the game on the field. He said the same thing. It was something that him and Duck were trying to perfect all week in practice. Not that they don't run it all the time, but it was something that I think he was really trying to rebound from that game last week, knowing that he really needed to step up attitude, uh, technique, perfection. And I just thought it was really cool that Santoni was there helping with that. And also, um, Deontay Johnson is the first Steelers rookie to return a punt return for a touchdown since Santonio. So. Oh, wow. It's kind of this weird, you know, right. Steelers yeah. driving up. TJ Watt, yeah. mm -hmm. James Harrison, outside linebackers. Yeah, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Arizona. Yeah. Cardinals quarterbacks not thinking they were going to be where they ended up being. Right. Yeah. Good memories. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> All right, Charlie, uh, one last question in terms of the offense. What's Duck doing better as he's getting more starts, getting more confident, and getting more comfortable being the leader of this offense? I like his demeanor at the line of scrimmage. I mean, he's really commanding the huddle, and he's having that conversation on the side with Randy Feekner to sit back and say, hey, these are the plays that I'm comfortable with. So he's not panicking. He's getting the ball out of his hand, and that's exactly why he was inserted into the lineup. So I think from a confident perspective, man, he's – on cloud nine at this point, and rightfully so, because he's helping. He's doing his part to help this team win. Well, and some of the things you talk about with his confidence, I'm loving his decision making. I think about that uh, the fourth down. It's actually third down play. Deontay Johnson late in the game where he could have ran. He's scrambling out the pocket and he sees Deontay coming late, hits him across the middle for the first down, ultimately killing a lot of that time off the clock. Just seeing different things like that are the things that I'm really impressed with by him. I really think the key for him, though, is the fact that he is earning these reps mm -hmm. by not turning the ball right. over. Absolutely. Because if he would throw a couple of picks early, I think the hook would come out. And that would be the only thing, I, I believe, between now and whenever this season ends that will cause him to lose his job. If he starts turning the ball over because, as you guys mentioned, you know his other parts of the game playing the position, again, no delay game penalties. No burn timeouts, not getting the play, getting mm -hmm. guys up to the line of scrimmage mm -hmm. and, and getting all of that kind of stuff done. And, you know, Mike Tallman, I was talking to him about uh, Devlin Hodges. Uh, did he play a lot of under center? And he said, well, I don't know about high school, but he did very little of it mm -hmm. uh, in college. In college. Yeah. And, you know, that's an adjustment too, I, I would imagine. I mean, uh, so he's handling a lot of those things cleanly 
which is going to allow him to stay on the field and continue to develop a lot of the other things you guys have been talking and, about. And those runs right there that you see, 14 yards, 21 yards, that those are defense's killers right there because yes. when they play two-man <laughs> and you're able to burn them with your legs mm -hmm. from the quarterback position, they won't do it anymore. So trust me, the upcoming opponents, they're watching they're that watching saying, it. we can't play 22-man against Hodges at this point. No, that's 100% accurate, man. Anytime you're playing any type of man coverage and you have a quarterback that's mobile like that, it minimizes what you're allowed to do because those plays do kill you. All right, we have much more to cover here on the Steelers Roundtable, including our predictions. The time capsule will open those up. Hopefully we did a little bit better than we have in previous <laughs> weeks. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Whatever play is called, you know, I'm going to go out there and execute it. Um, I mean, if, if the coaches didn't have the confidence in me, I, I don't think I'd be playing. So uh, just got to have a good, good game plan. And, you know, when that play was called or when those plays were called, just execute them. Are back it is time to open our time capsule these are the predictions that we put in here prior to heading to Arizona we so just did those. no we didn't <laughs> we don't cheat here on the Steelers round table all right labs speaking of which mm. I picked yours first if the Steelers put up a goose egg in the first quarter they won't win the game um yeah I really believe that you didn't want to go in, you know, regardless of the Cardinals record, the kind of offense that they have, I, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable allowing them to, to play from ahead right at, at the start. And so, uh, and it worked out great. And it was more than just the offense and special team scoring points. I really thought that the, the defense did its part because the Cardinals had three possessions in the first quarter, punted all three times. And so when your defense is holding them to zero, um, you know, you don't need many points to be in the lead. And so, yeah, that, that was kind of the emphasis I thought most of last week. And I just didn't believe that the Steelers offense could continue to come back from these holes. 10 nothing, you know, 7 nothing, that kind of stuff. 14 nothing, you know, I yeah, think, against the you Dolphins. You don't have Ben. Yeah. Correct. And so, um, but everything worked out okay. Okay. All right, I'm next. Duck will play a clean game. Hey, he did right, not kill okay. us as Coach Hall. <laughs> right, okay. So, well, I think we've talked about him enough. All I think right. that one's fair. All right. Arthur, ah. Steelers defense will have three turnovers. You definitely hey. should. Hey. He just hey. put that in the box. I have the receipt on my phone. I sent the text Friday morning at 8.24 a.m., and that was Eastern Standard Time, by the okay. way. Oh, wow. Yes. You, yeah, you're, you're yes. on it. Okay. All right. Charlie, the Steelers will rush for over 150 yards. I was close. So close. I was yeah. close. You were close. so close. And the thing that was tempting is the fact that the Cardinals defense were giving up 300 yards passing. So that's the low-hanging fruit. But that's not the formula of this offense. Right. I felt really felt, okay, if you duck is right around 20 attempts, the rushing game could get going. They did have 140 yards rushing. 140. So. Mm -hmm. They hosed you, though, Charlie. They gave <laughs> yeah. Jordan Berry minus eight on the fake. Oh, See, I was, yeah. I was close. Even closer. Yes, I, was, uh, I was close. So. And then, and then for, that wild for the Elias. And for the Wildcat play as well, was that considered a pass? Because that should have been a run, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they got you on your yards, man. I was close. But not, I mean, your three turnovers, that was impressive. I, 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 I was just feeling it, man. I thought that the way this defense was I read it over playing, her shoulder. Man. It said two. She <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't cheat for anybody. Man. I don't three. cheat for anybody. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for today's roundtable. Uh, I have a little Missy's motivation coming your way from rookie Benny Snell. So take a listen and have a great day. We'll see you guys next week. You know, we're fighting for, for everyone in the locker room. We're fighting for everybody that we line up next to. Um, the defense fight for the offense, the offense fight for the defense. So we step up, we make plays, and we got trust in each other. So that's what I say.